Tap lower down. You know it's true. You know it's true. We're all guilty of it. Uh, one of the worst things that you can ask me to do is just check my bank account. And it's crazy because you think at my age that would be comfortable. But it's not always super comfortable when it comes to looking at uh, whether how, how good you are at it or like how terrible you're at it. Uh, I love it. Simple but beautiful execution on that video, Haya. Um, Okay, weird. I never ever start this way, but I, I promised someone I would do this, and, I, and uh, so I'm going to do it here. Um, some of you are in a position where you're kind of like, ah, you know, like uh, work has changed, or I'm at school, and uh, I need a little bit of cash. So our, our church, Hope City Church, which the project is part of, uh, they actually have this part-time job opening uh, for someone on the evenings and weekends, especially as winter comes, to just do some labor around uh, the church. And so if you're someone where you're like, yo, I can, I can pull some weights, uh, I, I, you know, I need just some part-time work, uh, paid, you know, paid pretty decent. If that's you and you want uh, or are interested in that, you can either contact me like right after the service or go to the info desk and we'll get you in contact. I never do that, but I, I, this is just something I promised I would do. And I know that a lot of you are just kind of maybe looking for some part-time options for you while you're in school and all that jazz. But let's get on with it. I want to ask you a question. What were the last few things you spent money on? Think about it. Even just the last like three or four things. Some of you came in with some coffee. None of you brought me one, I noticed. Uh, and you're hanging out in the lobby, you're drinking it. What other things did you spend your money on? So in a survey kind of done a little while ago, Canadians were asked what they tend to spend their money on outside of necessary expenses like rent, mortgage, etc. The most popular indulgence was food. 72% saying they dine out several times a month and some of you are like, a month? Try a week. Some of you are like, try by the day, right? 71% admitted to regularly ordering takeout, and half of can Canadians buy daily coffees. The report indicates that young adults are more likely to order takeout and buy coffee purely because of convenience. What have you recently spent your money on? Here's the kicky, kick, kicky. Here's the kicky. Another word for kicker. One third of Canadians admit they don't put anything into their savings on a monthly basis. I won't ask any of you to agree with that by hand. But 50% of Canadians aged 18 to 38 have spent money they didn't have and gone into debt in order to keep up with their peers. Yo, that's you. Look to your right, look to their left, and say it's your problem, right? Because, I mean, there's a 50% chance you're right, right? Not surprisingly, many Canadians have said that they'd be willing to sell an organ to get out of debt. And we asked the question, would you sell your organ or what would you do? And there's some, like, great responses. My two favorite are this. I would, I would be slapped by the rock, which, what a great answer. And the best answer is, I'd move to America. That is dangerous. Uh, very dangerous. If you were smart, you would commit someone else's organ to pay off your debt. I hear the organ harvesting industry is huge these days. Here's the thing. This is why we wanted to do this series called My Life is a Haunted House. Because honestly, sometimes the scariest thing you can be confronted with is your own life. Your finances, your lack of self-control, maybe the emotions you can't control, maybe it's these unhealthy coping mechanisms that you have, whether it's drinking or you're, you know, smoking something or whatever the case, there's these coping mechanisms that we just like, oh, it's just like, I, I wish that wasn't part of my life, but it kind of has taken over. Or like we said, tonight we're going to start with the whole concept of money. We kind of want to force you through the haunted house that is your life and begin turning the lights on because we think... The worst thing you can do is ignore it. The worst thing you can do is kind of move on to it. And I think that if we don't handle this stuff, it's going to handle you. And it'll handle you for years to come. There's no better time, no better time to turn the light on in your freaky deaky life than right now. We just got to. 
My next question, what do you think, though, and what do you think most people think when I mention the word church and money in the same sentence? Probably something like, well, the church wants all of it. Or at least me to have none of it. And you're like, that's okay, I'm a college student, and I'm following Jesus well because I've got no money, right? Like, that's the idea. And honestly, it's, you're right. I'm glad we cleared it up. The night's over. No, you know, it's, it kind of makes a little bit of sense, though, because, I mean, if you were to read the Bible, and you'd read the things that Jesus said about money, or you read through what God said about money in the Old Testament, and, and you can kind of understand that there's a bit of a weird relationship and dynamic between spirituality and money, or God and money. I mean, just a few highlights for you. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you, and I feel like, like, I feel like every person doesn't have money, it's like, yo, that's the best prayer I've ever heard, Right? Your wealth has rotted, your moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded. That's found in this book called James. This one book called Ecclesiastes says this, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Yo, how true is that? Right? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Or that this particular story I want us to be in tonight, I'm going to read it for you, and I'm going to start off, and it starts off with this one verse. It's found in this book called Matthew. Matthew is one of the first of the four Gospels. What I mean by that is just, it tells the story of Jesus. It gives us an indication of the witness of his words and his actions. And in this chapter 19, it talks about this rich young man. And it goes like this. Someone came to Jesus with this question, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What's it going to take for me to follow you, to kind of be okay with you? Jesus responds, why ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, we'll keep the commandments. Well, which ones? The man asks. And Jesus replied, you must not murder. Check. You must not commit adultery. Check. You must not steal. Yeah. You must not testify falsely. Oh, I've done that. Honor your father and mother. Mm -mm. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. Must be feeling pretty good. He's like, what else must I do? And Jesus told him this. If you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad. For he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the people who were following him, that kind of gravitated to his life, listening to his words, learning what it means to follow Jesus, and he says this to them. I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. I'll say it again, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It seems harsh. Like, the guy seems legitimately interested in knowing what it means to follow Jesus. Does it really require an abandonment of all our possessions, our money, in order to follow him correctly? Is, is that what Jesus is advocating for? Like I said, it seems a bit intense. First things first, and I want to lay this out. Jesus, God, are not against money, not against the accumulation of wealth or the desire to have a good paying job. It's not what it's really about. The story of this rich young man talking with Jesus is actually a story of contrast. You probably missed this, but there's actually two rich people in this story. You got the rich young man, but then you also have Jesus. In this book called Philippians, it explains who Jesus was, and it says this about him. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges— which means he gave up his riches, he gave up his throne, he gave up his cushy life, he gave it up. He took the humble position of a slave. Let me ask you a question. How much money do you think a slave or a servant has? Zero. Two rulers, both flush with cash. Two different ideas about what money is and how to handle it. See, the rich ruler, his idea was to hold on to it as much as possible hold on to it. So he was kind of enslaved to it. Where Jesus, he sets an example of actually giving it all up. Giving it all up to set others free. The story is really telling us that money, what money actually is. What is money? Well, I think we know this, but money, 
is power. Think about it. In our world, and especially in Jesus' day, it's no different, there isn't much, there's very little, that has the power to move and shape, to touch and affect our world in general and in personally than money. Money can empower or it can control. It can provide a hope or it can keep you from achieving or accomplishing much. Money has a power to shape your world or monstrously shape you. Money, if not handled correctly, can handle you. To Jesus, what we do with our money, or maybe lack thereof, believe it or not, it does matter. The Jesus-based life demands a revaluation of every part of our life, and our money and our wallets, although very personal, are not outside of that realm. When Jesus says to pick up your cross and follow me, he didn't say, but like, it's okay, like, do whatever you want with your money, where he's like, you know, drop your life, follow me, but like, keep your Scotiabank scene card, you know, like, you got to get dim points for all the theaters you can't go to now, right? Like, he doesn't say that. The way we handle our money, he's saying, is all about following Jesus well, or not. Remember, this story was... This man asking Jesus, how do I have eternal life? How do I follow you properly? This is a story about followership. And Jesus is teaching about what money is and what it has a power to do purely by how we handle it. And he says, you know what the litmus test is for money? Whether we have control over it or has control over us, he says is this, are we willing to give it up for what really matters? Are we willing to dip into our wallet to let go of it for what really matters? And there's no greater way to know what you really value in your life than taking a look at what you spent your money on. It's very easy for us to say we value something. That's like a good, it's good thinking, right? It's what we call good orthodoxy. It's, it's, Good thinking about the Bible and about theology and what God thinks about things. And you can believe something, but if you don't have good orthopraxy, good practice, it means that just because you believe something, just because you value something, doesn't actually mean that you automatically live it. What if, though? What if? And this is what the story is challenging. This is what I want to challenge you with. And this is something that's constantly challenging me. Listen, I never outgrow this. And it's this. What if we lived in a way that we believed that money has the power to shape you and shape our world. That whatever, however much you have, I don't care if you've got tons of money stacked under your mattress or in Swiss bank accounts. I was talking about a weird story. I was talking with this, like, this five-year-old kid. I don't talk to five-year-old random kids, but it was one of my daughter's friends. And it'd be weird and I'd be arrested. Anyways, it was, it was my daughter's little friend. And he was saying, yeah, my daddy has money stashed in different places. And I thought, oh, I want to dig in that. But I didn't because it's less, you know, a little private. And he's like five years old. What does he really know, right? Well, probably, actually, what does he know? Anyways, whether you got money stashed someplace or you've got money nowhere, right? What if, though, what if all the money in the world or no money at all, what if still... It could be used to shape you and shape our world profoundly. I think that's what Jesus is getting at. That money is first a spiritual reality where it speaks of a spiritual reality within our own souls and hearts. And we need to rethink how we think about money. See, even if you don't follow Jesus, the same is true for you. According to Jesus in the Bible, if we don't believe this, ultimately, it's not simply about being bad stewards of our money. It's about bad followership. You can't serve both God and money. Now, what are some signs? Signs that it has you. Signs that you're not in control, but it's controlling you. Here's some signs. Everything you own is actually owned by the bank. You're scared to check your bank account. You cannot pay off your monthly balance regularly on your credit card. You've not, you don't have a saving goal. And there's no room to enjoy some of your cash responsibly. You're always asking or expecting to be bailed out. You have no idea where your student loans or any of your debts are, debts are at. Now, now, hear me out here. It doesn't mean that you need to know all these things perfectly. 
But I think some of us are just like, well, how will I just don't worry about any of that? Because you know what's smart? Not knowing where it is. Then you're not responsible, right? You know, like signs that money has you is that you're actually kind of scared of it. You're kind of arm's length with your cash. And Jesus is like, no, no. How you handle your money and how you view it has a lot to say about where you're at spiritually. And what we ultimately see in this ruler's life that we were reading about earlier was that the wrong use of money alters our view of God, alters the view of ourselves, and it alters how we view other people. Like, let me explain that. It alters our view of God. And if you read the story right at the beginning, he's like, someone came to Jesus with this question, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? The idea is this, is like, how much money, how many good things do I need to do in order for you to be okay with me? As if God is just some, this genie that you've got to kind of rub him the right way. And Christina Aguilera starts singing it, and then you're just like, Jesus is like, eh, you're all good, right? Anyways, it, it alters the view of God. It's, it, we think, and I think this is kind of where prosperity gospel comes out of sometimes too, right? It's like, if I, if I have enough money, if I look a certain way, if, if I'm able to take some really nice fall autumn shoots with my best buds, then I'm okay with God. Hashtag blessed, right? Too anointed to be disappointed. I got a lot of those, right? Um... And there's an idea, too, that he saw it as his wealth, that that almost like he's like, well, this is kind of my money. I'm going to do what I want with it. And and it's an altered view of understanding, like there's this place in the Bible where it basically says, like, be thankful for the fact that you have a job. Be thankful that you have the ability to work. Be thankful that you have money because the Lord provides for you those things. And it's an understanding of, like, seeing what you have as being given to you as a blessing and a grace from God for us to steward well, because it changes our perspective on how we handle it. Because someone gave you a Ferrari to drive, you try not be an idiot and drive it responsibly. Maybe keep it in your garage during winter. Don't be like the Lamborghini guy that drives all over Edmonton. Be a little more careful with it. But if you think you own it, you feel like you can do whatever you want with it. And Jesus is like, no, let's change a perspective. So either you see God as you got to have a certain amount of something, or if you do the right things, and then, then God's going to be happy with you. It alters the view of God, if that's the way you view it. Bad stewardship also changes the way we view ourselves. He says this, I have obeyed all these commandments, young men replied. What else must I do? And this comes down to like, we determine who we are based on what we have. And I want to remind you that the gospel, that the good news of Jesus is that you are, your worth is not determined by what you have. You're determined purely by what God has done for you. Whether you're poor or rich, broken or you think you're together, Jesus' love and affection and grace for you doesn't change. But money has this way of altering how we view ourselves. That if I don't have, listen, 50% of us make decisions with our money based on what other peers are doing and we'll get into debt to look like them. It's altering how we view ourselves. We're saying that my bank account is telling me how I should feel about myself. It breeds greed and selfishness and being ungrateful. The stress and the anxiety and the depression that comes from not handling it well. An unhealthy balance. It feeds our insecurities. It feeds our impatience. But it also alters a view of other people. I want you to catch this. So Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions. Here's the point. And give the money to the poor. That's the point. The point is, how can so many of us have so much that we don't think of those who have little? That is the gospel. The gospel is how do we, how do we set captives free? How do we bring justice? How do we unrelease the chains of the oppressed? And you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. But then the young man heard this. He went around and saw all the poor people around him. And he figured, I should hold on to my cash. I mean, you see it. You see the fact that in, in, the, in the Western world, we hold the majority of possessions. 
where there are still billions of people in the world without fresh drinking water. And we're all guilty of it. I know we are. You can't think of removing other people's limits if you yourself are so hindered and limited because of your debt or your bad financial management. Bad stewardship has the power to affect your view of God, your view of yourself, and your view of others. Good money management is one of those things that requires awareness. It requires intentional effort in the right direction. So whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, what I, here's what I propose. Here's what I propose to help you begin stewarding your finance as well, if maybe you're in there. So maybe you're, you're really good at it, and maybe this just be an encouragement for you to keep going. Maybe it's an encouragement for you to help maybe some of your friends who just need help, need encouragement. I want it to move this from haunting you to something you feel like you have control over. And it begins by flipping the light switch on. And it's going to suck. It may hurt a little bit, but can I help you move in this direction? First thing is this, is if you want to start having a healthy relationship with your money and you want to begin looking at it as, God, how do I just follow you well in this area of my life? Can I encourage you to start with gratitude? Gratitude leads us to think about what we have when so often we're so focused on what we don't have. Gratitude forces us to look at our life, to assess it and ask, man, what do I really have? What can I be happy for? What am I blessed with? Do I really need that when I already maybe have so much? Gratitude. It's a great place to start. Interesting thing. Studies have shown over and over again that people who practice mindful gratitude or mindful thankfulness have less material, instincts of materialism, less consumeristic, they have a more generous attitude and lifestyle if they practice this as a regular thing. And thirdly, anxiety, depression, loneliness, and other mental health issues are affected in a positive way. The studies are incredible. We've, we've talked about it before at the project actually a few times. Start with an attitude of gratitude. Oh my goodness, I didn't even mean to rhyme that. I'm a poet and I didn't even know it, right? Anyways, start with gratitude. Great place to start. Second place is this, is generosity. The only way you can combat greed, the only way you can fight greed, the only way you can kind of reverse the effects of greed is actually through generosity. It's, it's the only way. And you're like, okay, here you go about giving to the church. And you're right. Actually, throughout scripture, God speaks very plainly about this. And there's things in the Old Testament that we read about that talks about giving and not just giving to a place to support the community because that's what was called the storehouse. You give to support the community, but also you keep a certain amount of your field, for example, for the wanderer who doesn't have a home or who needs hungry and is fed. And it says you need to keep mindful of those things. And through the New Testament, there's not really like a, a certain amount, but we always think percentages are better because when you think of financial management, percentages are better. Thinking of a percentage means that no matter what you have, there's something that you can manage that you can deal with. And one of the biggest reasons, not because God wants your money, God doesn't need it. What he's saying is this, what has your heart? And to be Christ-like means to be generous, irrationally generous, but none of us will ever become generous if we continue to feed greed. Man, I did it again. I'm so good at rhyming. You just won't. You won't become generous unless you deal with it. And so right in the system of Christianity is this concept of giving. And you're like, well, what if I don't follow Jesus? <laughs> I'm off the hook. No, you're not. Find something worth giving to regularly. An organization, something. Remember I told you about what you spend your money is actually what you value? Maybe you can actually start affecting what you value by giving to it first. This is where money can change lives. It's where money can resurrect hope. It can give a voice to the voices. It can do something way beyond what you could do yourself. Just even this upcoming weekend, we're giving $20,000 to people all around the world who are affected huge with food shortages and supply shortages due to COVID. We're, we're just choosing to do that. And next weekend, when you give, whatever you give is going to go directly towards that. 
Our church is consistently giving well over a million dollars all around the world and in our own province and in our country. Why? Because we believe in a rational generosity. And you got to remember, Jesus gave his entire life. He gave up his wealth and then he gave up his entire life. He's not asking us to do something. He's not done in the extreme. Generosity. Do you really care? Prove it by budgeting your activism and your beliefs and your values. Whoa, okay. <laughs> Never knew gratitude sounded so angry. Uh, sound plan is the third part. I have a sound plan. Basically, know what you make and plan for what you want. You've all seen these. You've been in school long enough. You get these like really corny sayings, right? You get like a picture of like parachuters in a circle. You know, it's like, imagine, right? I don't know if you saw this one. You know, maybe you can finish for me. If you plan, if you fail to plan, what? Did you guys not go to school? You plan to fail. And it's true. Spend less than you have. The greatest, the greatest financial advice I've ever been given is this, live within your means. Spend less than what you make. Don't make a credit card purchase, for example, that you can't pay off that month. Who do you want to be? Where do you want to be? What do you want to be remembered for? How do you want to make a difference? Do you want to be unburdened financially? Then make a plan. M money's like water. If you don't manage it, it will destroy your house. It requires some consistent attention. I'm not saying you got to just don one of those like see-through green visor hats and just like every penny every day. It's just, are you consistently, maybe weekly, looking at where it's going? Are you planning where it needs to go? There are advisors, free advisors, especially for young adults, especially for post-secondary students. There are tons of really good free advisement to help you do this. In fact, at the end, I'm actually going to post up tons of resources. So I got apps, books, websites, and podcasts you can listen to that are meant to be quick and meant to help you manage money. And when you leave, you're going to see these posters with QR codes. Scan it, open up your camera app, scan it, it's going to open up, you're going to get the whole resource list. We want to help you. And lastly, this is the hardest. Quit the comparing game. There is no lie that will enslave you in a more powerful way than comparing ourselves to someone else. So many of us, we live in this world of comparing ourselves to what other people have on social media or just from a distance. Listen, no one is posting pics of the monthly card to card statement for you to see. They're not showing you their budget. They don't show you all the cutbacks. In fact, I just read an article this week. This guy is saying, like, we need to stop all of these, like, musicians from renting all these mansions, private jets, all these things, telling people this is their life, when most of them live very close to the poverty line. Very rarely do what you see actually matches. It's, I, I'm sorry to say, this, it's like those people who make those MLM pitches to you. Retire by 35. I'm not going to, I don't work a day in my life. Yeah, they probably do actually. They're selling you on a lie. Stop the comparison game. If you want to compare yourself to anything, this is what we want you to do. Compare yourself to where you were and where you want to be. Compare yourself against your own potential. Am I better this week than I was last week? Am I moving closer to where I need to be, where I feel like God is asking me to be? Am I being more faithful with my finances? Am I understanding it better or am I further away? That's the only person you need to be comparing yourself to is against your own potential. Is it get what, against what God has been asking and putting his finger on? This is about good followership. It's not just about finding a good way to arrange your money. It's about God, how can I live in a way that I'm not just free from greed, but I can actually see my wallet as a way of alleviating suffering in my world and around our world. How do I not 
get enslaved, but experience freedom from the anxiety and the stress that comes from just doing it wrong over and over. And listen, so many of us, including myself, was, were miseducated through high school and even early uh, young adult years. No one ever taught me how to do this. I had to learn all this stuff by accident in the worst way. I made so many financial mistakes, and I still do. But I don't want to make the mistakes right now that I was making at 21. And what if you didn't have to make the mistakes at 21? What if now you decided following Jesus means also asking God, how do I honor you with what and how I use my money? Here's a take home for you. That's what I want you to do as you go home. What were the last five things you spent money on? And ask yourself these questions. Was it all on you? Did it get you closer to who you want to be or where you feel like you need to be? Did it honor your God? Did it honor yourself? Did it honor others? And then what do you need to do about it now? Maybe that's a good list of questions to ask yourself even just every month. Am I moving in the right trajectory? Am I living under my means? Am I living generously? And am I managing in a way that I'm honoring God, I'm honoring myself, and honoring others? Like I said, you're going to see a resource list. It's going to look something like this. And when you scan the QR code, take it with you. It's going to be on your phone. Walk through it. Some really good accessible resources for you. Money. It either has you or you have it. And it's actually your decision on what that relationship is like. Would you mind standing? Let's pray together. And then the band's going to lead us in a time of worship together. Jesus, I, constantly I say this often and I continue to repeat it. You never ask us to do something you don't or haven't done yourself. Jesus, it can be scary, especially dealing with money, especially if we don't have a lot of it. God, help us to start small. Because I feel like if we don't do it in the small things, how are we ever going to think we're going to be responsible with the bigger things? And Jesus, I pray that you help us in the small. Just in one part. To move towards freedom. To move into a place that we feel like, God, the way that we handle our money is, is honoring to you. That it honors how you made us. And it honors the fact that God, you want to use us as part of your plan to alleviate spiritual and physical suffering in our world. God, help me. It's challenging me. It always does a once-over in my life, so I can imagine what it's doing to other people here. But Jesus, I'm thankful that by your grace and by your Holy Spirit, that this is an invitation to experience your transforming work in us. So Jesus, I pray that our lives, our hearts be open to what you're saying and what you want to do. Amen.
searching for freedom and dumb it disgrace in the eyes of a familiar face. Burning 
star, a single fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I.
just thank you tonight. God, we thank you for that truth that you're the one who never leaves the one behind. God, we thank you that you care about every aspect of our lives. Even when it comes to things like our finances, like we were talking about tonight. God, you want all of us. And Father, I just pray for all of us tonight that you would truly teach us what it means to surrender to you. What it truly means to trust you with the things that we own, the things that we possess. God, I pray that you would just help us to kind of loosen our grip on that stuff and just begin to live generously, to begin to live just surrendered to you, just willing to do whatever you call us to do. But God, we just thank you for this time of worship to be able to just come before you and, and just sing to you. And I just pray for every person, God, the rest of this week, Lord, that you would be with us as we go from this place. And see your name we pray.